Um, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Sebastian Fong. I'm moderating today's Grand Lines, and we have an exciting speaker lined up. Before we start, we do have an announcement um, about the primary care packet to first year students. For those of you who aren't working with a first year student already, we have an opportunity starting in January for those who are interested to have um, first year students work with you for um, up to 15 weeks a half day a week in clinic. Um, I've partially done this through Harborview, so I've had a good experience. And if you want to know more, you can email pcprac at uw.edu to find out more about that. On to today's speaker. I'm really excited to introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Bianca Frogner, who is a full professor and also a health economist with our department in the research section. And she's also the director of our Center for Health Workforce Studies um, and adjunct professor in the Department of Health Systems and Public Health in the School of uh, Public Health. So she has done a lot of work in policy and workforce, um, including in our state um, with our Healthcare Cost Transparency Board. Um, she's testified before people in Congress, um, worked with the National Academy of Medicine, and produced over 150 publications and given over 250 talks. So we're really excited to have her today to talk to us about um, how workforce issues. I'll leave it to you to yeah. talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And thank you for those who are in the room here today and for those joining online. Um, folks in the room, please feel free to get up and go get more food. I know there's a good amount of Chipotle for anyone who missed out on being here in person. It smells delicious. <laughs> so it's so nice to be back here in the, in, in person. Uh, it's been a few years since I've been to the uh, Northgate clinics and some things have not changed, but some things have changed. And uh, it's always interesting to kind of see uh, our community evolve. Um, so I do see quite a few uh, familiar names uh, online and here in the room. And um, so uh, I'll do it. Just and Sebastian did a really nice job um, introducing me. So thank you so much. So I'll just add just a couple more things um, that might be relevant to the conversation today uh, before kicking off my talk, which is going to be about health workforce challenges. Uh, so I've been in the department for nearly a decade now, um, and I came here to direct the Center for Health Workforce Studies. And I'm very fortunate to be leading a fantastic team. I can see many folks are there online too. And so the, some of the work today that I'll be talking about really is in collaboration with some of my team members. I have to figure out exactly where I'm gonna point this to. They're not... Hmm. So, okay, all right, sorry. So technical things because I figure out where exactly I point my pointer to. Um, so I might talk a little bit about uh, the team that I lead and kind of what what we are and what we do before I kind of dive into today's topic, where I will be talking a little bit about um, the health workforce first, kind of defining who's who I'm talking about when I talk about the health workforce. That seems like an obvious thing, but it's always good to kind of level set to make sure we're all on the same page about when we're talking about health workforce, who we have in mind. We'll talk about the COVID effect on uh, turnover and what we're kind of finding. Uh, I'm going to link that with diversity of the health workforce and a little bit about how COVID also is affecting some of the diversity uh, of our workforce. And then uh, I can tend to be a little bit uh, in the realm of telling you a lot of problems. So I'll try to also talk about some solutions <laughs> um, and things that we uh, that are being discussed, uh, being pondered uh, as we try to solve some of these challenges. Um, so the Center for Health Workforce Studies, uh, as Sebastian uh, mentioned, is sitting in the Department of uh, in the Department of Family Medicine in the research section. Um, and I feel very fortunate to have come in to step into an entity that already has had a nice long history, uh, where we are now celebrating our 25th year of being in the department. Um, and our center conducts health workforce research with an aim to try to inform policymakers and other health workforce planners, whether it be educators, other employers, um, uh, other folks in, the, uh, in professional societies who really want to understand who's in the workforce and what do they do and how do we support them. And our work is done through a number of grants and contracts, um, both at the state and federal level. We also work with professional health professional organizations to carry out our work. 
And a lot of the themes in our work tend to focus on things like understanding career pathways of healthcare workers, uh, trying to look at some policies and programs to diversify our workforce. And, uh, and a big overarching theme is thinking about ways that we can effectively recruit and retain our workers. And again, this is just uh, some of the snapshot of the uh, people in our uh, center and uh, the wonderful group that I get to work with who are both in the department and also outside of the department and beyond the university. Uh, I do want to point out that we do, uh, we are the home of two federal grants that are center grants out of the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, but this isn't our only uh, uh, pot of money, unfortunately, but it is a core set of funds. Um, and maybe of interest to folks here in the room, especially given the importance of health equity and thinking about the role of health equity in thinking about our health workforce. And so we do have a portfolio of work uh, there, uh, where uh, which we've got about, I guess now we're entering our sixth year now in that grant portfolio, where we're thinking about broad definitions of, of health equity, thinking about the diversity of the workforce, thinking about the role of healthcare workers in addressing health disparities with the aim of improving health equity. Uh, we also have this allied health portfolio, um, which uh, yeah, that's a term that's kind of a tough one to really define well, uh, but I'll say that basically that allows us to look at a broad spectrum of workers outside of physicians, nurses, and dentists. Yeah, those three groups get kind of excluded here, but pharmacists will include, and so it's not defined by level of education, it's just kind of more of a broad brush that, uh, giving us an allowance to highlight a lot of different kinds of workers, which we really try to do. Uh, not just in this portfolio of work, but in general in all of our work, is that we really try to bring a face to all the different kinds of people who work in healthcare. And this thing will come up again and again throughout my talk today. And I do welcome folks to kind of chime in or, you know, raise your hands or, you know, especially in the chat over there, raise your hand. We have someone monitoring chat if any questions arise. And I, uh, we are not the only uh, health workforce research center that exists. There are many health workforce research centers actually around the country. This is just a, a set of the uh, centers around the country that are funded through persons grants. Um, and there, even within HRSA, there's a number of other grants that also contribute to health workforce research, including our own Whammy Rural Health Research Center within the department, which has a 35 year history. And while the focus area for them is rural health, Workforce is a big theme of that work. So there's a whole nother portfolio of folks who do like rural health research and they have a lot of overlap with work we do. But I do want to encourage you that to check out our other center uh, colleagues uh, around the country and in particular to get started that Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center in particular is a nice hub. It's much like the rural gateway for the rural health research centers as like a place where all of our work goes to as a place to be disseminated. It includes webinars and other uh, kind of tips and tricks about how to use different data sources. So it's a, it's a great resource for folks who may want to better understand this area. And all of our work is funded up first of it, uh, uh, under this portfolio of work, but specifically the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis. And they're the group who do the projections for our physician projections and health projections when we think about shortage and uh, oversupply of workers. All right, so I'm going to dive into my talk today. And again, starting off with some kind of basic definitions before uh, maybe going to, so some of this thing, these things may seem kind of obvious to you all, but I'll start here uh, before I kind of dive into COVID's effect. So probably no surprise to you all, healthcare is a big industry. <laughs> there are a lot of people who work in healthcare. It is one of the largest industries in the economy. It's hard to exactly pinpoint, like, are we number one or number two? Because it's sometimes hard to really get your hands around the size of our Department of Defense or military, who tends to be one of the other very large employers, or, or the government for that uh, matter. But suffice it to say, in the United States, uh, I think this was uh, 2022 data, uh, we're, we have approximately 17 million people who work in the healthcare industry. Now that is the, the way I'm using, uh, uh, defining this is using data out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's out of the Department of Labor. They are a fantastic source of information about our workforce broadly in the economy. And they use various codes and I can certainly like, rattle off all sorts of occupation codes and industry codes, but these are some major groupings as defined by these occupation codes that uh, just give you a sense of the spread and the distribution of the different kinds of workers. And um, I'll note that physicians, which play a very important role in our workforce, is approximately 3.5% of that pie. Nurses, uh, registered nurses in particular, 
are one of the single largest occupational groups in our workforce. And when you combine them with advanced practice registered nurses, which is a smaller part of that, but they still have that registered nurse background and training, we're talking about 17% of the workforce. So combined physicians and nurses, they are about one fifth of our workforce. But I do wanna point out the other very important groups that you probably see every day in your clinics, like our healthcare support workers, that can be your medical assistants in particular. And when you combine those roles all together, one in four of the folks who work in healthcare are in one of these aid or assistant type of roles. Um, and then not to be forgotten, a lot of our allied health workers, uh, they are about 17% out of five. And then there are a lot of other people who work in healthcare who not have a direct patient facing role. So those can be your groundskeepers, your maintenance, your food service workers. And this is looking across all different kinds of industries. And I'll get to that in a moment. Now, I'll mention that there are some groups that are not captured very easily in this pie, and that includes folks who work in retail pharmacies. It's just kind of an artifact of how the codes work. It doesn't identify uh, pharmacists within the healthcare sector. You can identify all pharmacists, but if I were to put a boundary of like, well, what kind of setting are they in? Well, I can maybe find the pharmacist, but I can't quite distinguish if they're working in a retail setting, are they working in, in healthcare? I mean, you probably can assume that one a little bit easier than others, but there's a lot of other kinds of folks uh, in, in the retail pharmacy setting that are a little bit hard to capture in this pie. Folks who work for insurance companies are also not included in here. Now, I will say, if you're on the billing side of a hospital, the billing insurer, they are in that pie. So this is saying people working for the United um, Health of the world, they're not captured in here. And they're manufacturing, folks who are developing all the little uh, equipment that you use in the everyday setting, that's not included here. But I know that it's not a huge number that we're missing, maybe it's a one or two million more folks, approximately, I would say, that we might be missing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, nursing homes, are they? Yes, yeah, so they're in here. And so that gets me exactly to the next slide, which is great. So thank you for setting me up. <laughs> so another way to break down that saving 17 million people is by setting. So about a third of the folks in the healthcare industry work in a hospital setting. Uh, another third work in some kind of ambulatory care setting, whether that be clinics like this, can be other outpatient settings. It can be your uh, federally qualified health centers. I believe ambulatory surgical centers are also in here. Uh, you have your PT, uh, you know, offices, chiropractic offices, they all show up here. And then about another third are in what we would call long-term care. Now we can get into kind of a nitty gritty about home health care, which is technically an ambulatory care setting from your labor statistics standpoint, but really they're delivering a lot of long-term care. So we tend to group them together. And when you do, you recognize that long-term care, whether it be nursing homes, including skilled and unskilled or skilled and other residential facilities that uh, all two together, they're about a third of that pie. All right. So all those people, they were stress tests during the pandemic. And I have to say that's a concept that my, my colleagues uh, uh, outside of here have kind of come up with and I'll come back to some of the discussions around some of the stress testing of our workforce and kind of where, why, why we talk about that. But generally, you all know, you have experienced it, you lived through the last few years, it's been a tough time. You were probably pushed to your breaking point and it's been rough to recover. And I'll say the recovery has been really uneven. So this kind of brings me to some of some numbers just to show you what recovery has been like for our healthcare workers. So this figure, there's a lot of lines on here, but what this is trying to show you is what employment trends have been like since the beginning of the pandemic or right before the pandemic. So the flat horizontal red line indicates the level of employment pre-pandemic. So at the very start of the, on the left-hand side of the graph, that's showing you the employment level um, in January of 2020. So, okay, one can argue maybe the pandemic was starting to happen to start. Come on in, come on in. Um, and uh, and not, probably not a uh, not, uh, surprise is relative to the start of the pandemic, everybody basically started hemorrhaging workers. Jobs were lost. But it started to creep back up by the time we got to fall of 2020. And... For most, for most part, many sectors are on an upward trend. Now, folks uh, probably uh, have read the news. <laughs> Hospitals say they're struggling. I'm not so sure, I'll be honest, maybe I say this just in a closed room with friends. I'm not so sure I fully believe them entirely. You know, I started looking at this and I realized, and a colleague pointed this out to me, is that it took them 30 months to get to their pre-pandemic levels. Meaning they've, uh, 
even three months in, they were not growing at a level where they probably would have been in a counterfactual world where there was no pandemic. So in the meantime, demand was still continuing to grow and they have just been trying to recover back to where they were before the pandemic. So it's been a rough go for hospitals. Now, nursing facilities and residential care facilities, they're really still struggling. They're operating at about 10, uh, maybe 15% below their pre-pandemic employment levels still. Uh, and this line does include assisted living facilities, um, but the trend really is driven by the nursing facilities when I dug in deeper. Now, some folks have pointed out to me that some of this decline in employment is due to nursing home closures. So some just nursing homes just no longer exist. Some of for hospitals, there have been some hospitals and other kind of safety net hospitals that have closed during this period of time. But especially in the uh, nursing facility arena, quite a few of the nursing homes have closed. There also has been a shift starting before the pandemic, and that kind of indicates why they have a slightly slower decline over here, so that there has been this ongoing move to get people out of nursing homes. And that just accelerated, I think, during the pandemic, right? A lot of people were like, oh, I don't want my mom or dad in nursing homes. I want them in the home. And some of this is continuing on, um, especially as there are more policy initiatives to try to uh, move people. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, look at myself, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my colleague Jeanette Dill and I uh, at Minnesota, she and I published a paper uh, in GMA Health Forum um, a, earlier this year. Gosh, I'm sorry, I lose track of time. Um, but where we looked at uh, tur turnover rates using a data set called the Current Population Survey, which is a wonderful monthly household survey of everybody in the country. Um, and this allowed us to track a little bit more carefully what turnover was like for various workers across the same kind of cuts that I just showed in the earlier slides by industry, by occupation, and then some other demographics, which I'll show. Um, and in this uh, graph, uh, I'll generally say pre-period is about a year before COVID. So this kind of lumping in the averages of that. Post-period one is about nine, the first nine months of the pandemic. And the post-period two is another nine months, 10 months after that. So this went through, I believe, end of 2021, essentially. So uh, 2022 still needs to be examined, future work. Um, but a couple of key points um, to note is that everybody basically saw an uptick in turnover. And all of the very specific here, this is a very conservative measure of turnover. Turnover here is defined by the number of people leaving their occupation from the last year. So not their job. People can still, you know, stay stay as like a registered nurse, but now they work for a different employer. We did not, we are not actually able to ca capture that very easily in this data set. We're looking into how to improve the refinement on this in subsequent studies, but for the sake of this, we were just trying to get something like, ooh, they just left their job, because that's particularly concerning because those are people that we want back in to these jobs. So we wanted to get a sense of how often is this happening here? So we also looked at people who left to a state of unemployment and a state of being out of the labor force altogether. Again, labor that we, we want to bring back in and not lose just to the ether. And the one particular notable uh, trend that you'll probably see here, and it's mimicking some of the early, earlier graphs I just showed, is that in long-term care, which include your skilled nursing facilities and home health uh, care setting, that uh, since the start of the pandemic, they've just basically been on an upward trend, a fairly steady trend where their recovery rates aren't quite recovering in the same way as the other settings have. Now, when you bring, oh yeah. So, so I guess then this would suggest to me that historically long-term care facilities have a higher turnover. Yes, exactly. That's an exact, exact, a great point. Thank you. Uh, the orange line being long-term care, you can see before the pandemic, they were had the highest level of turnover relative to all the other industries. And I'll say the reason why this might be important for you all, but especially hospitals, is that this has ripple effects, right? When nursing homes are struggling to keep their staff, hospitals struggle to discharge their patients to nursing homes. And that creates challenges within the hospital setting. And I'm sure in primary care too, when you're trying to figure out how to manage people's care and 
try to find solutions. This is a frustrating ad day where you realize like maybe they can't get into long-term care settings. And I will say, I'll maybe acknowledge here, we didn't dive into behavioral health in uh, this study just because it's a smaller number and so it's harder for us to kind of pinpoint here, here what's happening. And they are kind of embedded in that ambulatory care setting and they're probably just kind of masked. But I do recognize that in behavioral health, that's certainly been a challenge too in terms of turnover. So I do want to when you look at it by occupations, and again, this is kind of some of the same occupational groups that we saw earlier, you'll see again, aids and assistance, that red line or orange line is at the highest level, meaning our aids and assistance have persistently had high levels of turnover relative to all occupational groups. Uh, and they have had some slower recovery. And slower is kind of indicated by the fact that the slope is somewhat more flat relative to where they started in that first nine months of the pandemic. Um, and also our LPNs and LVNs, there's been slowness. Now this is highly correlated with the fact that you have long-term care being a primary employer for LPNs and LVNs. Well, that's a little surprising to us uh, because again, I would say uh, it, 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 there are many discussions about the role of physicians and turnover here, but we did actually see a bit of an uptick. The level of the, uh, turnover in this, the way it's defined here, which is again, leaving your job, like so they're saying they're not a physician anymore and they're not employed or they're not, they're doing some other job altogether. Um, that turnover rate is relatively low, but it's been on an upward tick from what we saw since the start of the pandemic. And so that's not to be ignored. Uh, and it certainly reflects what we hear um, in the news, what you probably experience yourself. Um, so again, uh, the aids and assistance so far, where we see particularly high levels and what we just, uh, I think, really want to emphasize is that their recovery has been slow. So I'm going to take a slight detour here and talk a little bit about the diversity of the workforce, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about how COVID has affected the diversity, uh, or maybe affecting the diversity of our workforce, which is an area of work we're going to continue to do in our center. Now, just a little bit of framing, why do we hear about diversity? Well, this is just one framework that, that I mean, many of you probably already certainly are on board with this, but the, the, from a conceptual uh, model, the idea is that by increasing the diversity of your health workforce, you might be able to increase the kind of quality of care that you're delivering to patients and may make care more accessible for patients because they see somebody that looks like them and they feel like, oh, I, I want to go see that person. I feel comfortable talking about my care. Um, and in the end, hopefully this then results in re reduced health disparities and ultimately improvement in health equity. So a very simple model for what's a very, very complex uh, process. <laughs> um, so this is a study I did with a colleague, uh, Joanne Spetz at UCSF, funded through the same grant mechanism that we have here through HRSA um, and colleagues at Minnesota, where we, uh, this is uh, some years ago, but uh, the point of this graph is to try to show how diversity really varies across settings. So I talked about long-term care. That's what's highlighted here at the bottom is long-term care. And what, you're, what, what you should pay attention to are really kind of the blue lines relative to the orange, gray, and yellow line, where blue kind of indicates white healthcare workers. And the thing that I, I want, want you to really walk away today from uh, a message I will say is that healthcare is very diverse. A lot of people talk about how the health workforce is not diverse. It's not diverse uniformly across the healthcare sector. It is quite diverse in our long-term care settings, and that's including our residential care, nursing facilities, and home health care. In home health, over half of our health workers in the home health arena are something other than white as their race or ethnicity. Um, and that's really lost when you look at the aggregate picture, because if you look at the top two lines, healthcare is looking pretty similar to the rest of the economy in terms of what the workforce looks like. And you just lose some of that variability across the settings. Just to add to that, there is a correlation between diversity and education uh, or diversity by race and ethnicity and education. Uh, and so where we also see um, some differences that you might lose in the national picture is that in our long-term care settings, we have some of the least educated folks. Because again, these have a lot of really great entry level jobs at the assistant and aid level. So which require minimal levels of education, a high school degree, maybe some post-secondary education to enter these jobs. So it's a great opportunity to get in. They are predominantly filled by black and Latino workers. And I would say Latino workers because really these are mostly women who are working in these jobs. Um, 
But again, in the aggregate picture, when you look at healthcare relative to all other industries, we look like a very, very well-educated community. We, ha we, we have uh, only about uh, you know 20% or so of healthcare industry who has a high school degree. But if you look at our long-term care facilities, 40% of the workers there have a high school degree or less. And it's just important to understand that the social economic factors of our workers really matter. So how does that translate to turnover? So in that same paper I did with uh, Dr. Dill, um, we looked at that same kind of uh, model here by race and ethnicity. And there's a lot more going on here, but I'll uh, uh, focus on the orangish and the dark green line. Sorry, the colors are a little different here than at home. Um, but uh, while maybe not as super clear, what you can see is that their, uh, their rates of turnover are high. I would say all other healthcare workers other than white healthcare workers have high levels of turnover relative to all other groups, but our black and Latina workers in particular are seeing somewhat of a slower trend in recovery. And again, some of this is correlated with the jobs in which they're in and the settings in which they're in. So we didn't unpack all those different things as future work is <laughs> to try to tie it all together. But certainly the trends tend to tell a story. Now I'll say that, oh yes, please. Um, the rise and fall is really sharp for Asian those are tall. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know exactly. I, I think that one element of this is dentist offices. There uh, is a lot of Asian folks that are more represented in dental offices, yeah. which pretty much close entirely. And they saw sharp drops yeah. in, uh, in their employment. But I, I couldn't say 100% that that's, okay. but that's one of the pieces of the trend. It's also maybe related to where they're working in terms of am other ambulatory care settings too, and how many offices closed in those arenas during the pandemic. Yeah, please. Um, being in my late 70s, uh, so many of my friends, lost nine friends in the last mm -hmm. two years. Um, and so I, I'm very familiar with the home care services and population. Yeah. Um, and also my parents and my partner's parents all died at home <clears throat> in the previous decade. And um, so one of the things that really stands out is the number of immigrants that yes. are in these jobs. Yeah. And um, sometimes um, they had education from their own country that they cannot translate. Um, and, and I think that, um, and, and I mean, th there are people with, with amazing skills doing this kind of work. Yeah. Um, and it's actually really, really difficult. <laughs> um, right. Backbreaking work. Really. Yeah. But, but the managing a person with dementia and all those kinds of things in the home environment, <clears throat> um, I, I think it, it's very interesting. The, number of immigrants, the percent of immigrants that are in this in these jobs, and um, the types of education and skills that they actually bring to this yes. would be very interesting to break out. Well, thank you for bringing that up. So you're right, in home health, they have some of the largest percentage of immigrants who work in that job, or in that uh, setting. It's about one in five based on some older data that we have. But uh, we have done some work for our first grants to look a little bit more where immigrants are in uh, jobs. And a lot of, we do see high percentages of immigrants working in our aid and assistant jobs in particular. And like you said, there's this challenge in transferability of their skills, which uh, Davis Patterson uh, led some work along with Morhaf Alaktar um, to look, especially here in Washington state and talk to some of these um, uh, groups that were called welcome back centers that were tied to community colleges to better understand what were some of the challenges that immigrants were facing as they came to the United States to find a job in healthcare. And so I certainly would be happy to share some of the reports there. And um, I don't have all the details right at the tip of my fingertips, but essentially uh, some of the some of the challenges that they face are language barriers. Some of it is that they find that um, the you know they have to when they come here they need to get into a job they need to get paid taking time off to go through all the exams that they need to take while also learning the language and having it then go maybe hopefully through these tests and pass to get a job. Those are big uh, barriers for folks to try to address. And also some folks realize, well, you know, they came here for a better life where their pay was better than what they had at home. And they went into an occupation and they realized, well, 
this occupation, while it's not the same one as I had in my home country, pays me better than I would have expected. Right. So they they stop there. But I don't know that I would say that's a choice. I would say that right. like, feels like a false choice. Yeah. And so we had to really address like what are the underlying barriers that made them feel that that was as far as that they wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Because you're right, it's a loss of human capital. And we are doing some continued work looking at over education of our healthcare workers, especially among immigrants, to understand how much lost human capital mm-hmm. are we experiencing when immigrants come to our country with this healthcare background, especially right. when there's need. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Now, I do want to address the fact that we have very broad groupings of workers. So I just want to kind of point out a, a paper that really was led by my colleagues at George Washington University and was published in Health Affairs earlier this year, where uh, they broke down um, uh, the Latina and Hispanic workers to better understand the various ethnicities underlying them. And I, this is really mostly to show that just grouping people together as Latinas. Hispanic workers, grouping Asians together, grouping any of these racial and ethnic groups really does a disservice to all the challenges and nuances that happen within each of these groups. And one of the key things that came out of this study was the recognition that, um, you know, Cuban Americans tend to do pretty well in our country when they immigrate here. Uh, or if that's of their ethnic background, it doesn't even mean that these are people who immigrate here. They could be, you know, Cuban American, but generally that they found themselves in higher wage jobs, higher educated jobs, relative to uh, our Mexican uh, Americans or Mexican immigrants who came to this country. So there's some differences that we have to make sure we keep our eye on when we talk about the different racial and ethnic mix of our workers. And all to add. Race and ethnicity is just one dimension, a very important dimension of diversity. But there's so many intersections, as you can see. Education is an important uh, intersection. Gender, as I mentioned, a lot of people in this workforce are women, and I'll come and I'll point that out in this moment here, which is that women, in particular, throughout the pandemic and even before, have experienced high levels of turnover relative to men. Women have been struggling, and if you have children, men or women, your turnover rates are higher. And again, this is where they're leaving out of the workforce sometimes altogether. So we have to make sure that we're not losing this human capital. So how do we tip the scale between supply and demand, the workers and the employer needs? Now I can show you a supply and demand graph. I am a health economist, but it's been a while since I've pushed around demand and supply lines. So to make this a little bit simpler to say, and many of you have probably taken Econ 101, but I think in my mind, the more simple way to think about it is that there's a constant tension, a constant balance that needs to be done between the supply of workers and um, an employer demand. And employer demand is really a proxy for patient Right. I mean, employers are basically saying, I need to hire more people because I have all these patients. So you're playing, and some of your employers in the room, you're playing the role of trying to balance the needs of the patients with what's available to you locally or nationally. And the local labor, labor supply is going to be in, uh, influenced by a number of factors. Uh, you need a pool of people who are qualified. You need a pool of people who are willing to work. You need a pool of people who are actually able to work. And each of each of these things are, um, the tipping of that scale uh, is influenced by a number of factors, and that's the wedge that I put here, and this, these are just some examples. But we just can tip that scale. Policies tip that scale. Technologies tip, tip that scale. There are many things that can tip that scale. Now, let's just get a little bit more concrete. So during the pandemic, that affected the pool of workers, the pool of available workers. People got sick. Now, it's uh, it's tough to get a good number on how many healthcare workers got sick and died of COVID. Generally, I will say it is that the, the prevalence or the incidence of COVID, um, both having the disease and dying, seems to be less than the general population. Nursing homes are an exception. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nursing homes have seen high levels of uh, mortal- uh, deaths and, um, and morbidity in those settings. Um, a lot of that has to do with the beginning of the pandemic and how stro- how much of a struggle it was for them to get PPE in particular. Um, also, people, again, in these jobs are aides and assistants, and they struggle to have the option to uh, take time off from work and stay at home. A lot of people were making very, very difficult decisions about whether or not they were going to get paid and do work or be at home with their kids because they didn't have any other sources or networks to help them care for children. So 
these were very difficult choices that did put a lot of healthcare workers potentially at unnecessary risk. Um, now, uh, there are other reasons why we don't have um, workers, and that's that there are people who are not willing to work. They're there, but they're saying, I am burnt out. And I think that was a big theme of uh, Dr. Tim Haas at uh, Grand Rounds uh, about a month ago. He was our first Grand Rounds speaker, is this idea that in order to be a, sustained in your job, you have to think about, is this right fit for me? Is this really what I want to do? <laughs> and uh, a lot of workers, not just in healthcare, but certainly said, no, thank you. <laughs> this is not the risk I want to have. This is not where I want to continue my life. This, these challenges are just unsurmountable. And so we have to think about how to address that. And I'll come back to the, the potential solutions here. Um, we also need to think about how to make sure we have the right qualified applicants, right? So even again, you might have a pool of workers out there who have a title or experience of saying, oh, I was a registered nurse or I was a medical assistant. Well, but do they have all the skills that you need? Is a new graduate going to fill the role of an experienced person who has now retired early? They're not perfect substitutes. And there are solutions to each of these, some of which are discussed in broader social discussions that go beyond what we sometimes are able to do within our own individual settings, right? So these are, I find myself often realizing I'm talking about social justice issues all the time because that's what some of this sometimes comes to is, is, is saying, okay, in order to tip some of these scales, maybe we need to visit minimum wage rules. Now that goes beyond what we do here and, and can change maybe within um, uh, an employment study, you can change the wages of your workers themselves, but to change the minimum wage rules across the board is a challenge. Um, there are things that you have to do to make sure that uh, people have the support, of, uh, uh, the support in their work environment to feel like that they're valued, that they're appreciated, that they're able to do the work that they are trained to do, meaning that you have to have, make sure you have the policies that allow that to happen. So I'm gonna dive into some of this a little bit more. Um, so my colleagues and I across the various research centers and then other colleagues um, across the country uh, have spent a lot of time over the course of the last few years uh, discussing the, the need for a quick lever um, to basically get more people into the workforce is to make sure that people are working at their top of their license. And there were a lot of uh, relaxation of scope of practice during the pandemic, through emergency orders by state legislators, by governors, et cetera, to try to push out as many people as possible. Some of this work uh, in trying to figure out how much did that move the needle on the supply of workers is kind of up for future research. I do have a colleague, uh, Anne Nguyen, who uh, Anne was a, a PhD student here, actually at the School of Public Health, who's now a professor at Rutgers, who looked at really interesting data out of New Jersey and looking looked at like who, uh, when New Jersey relaxed their uh, relaxed uh, restrictions around licensure rules, they, she looked at like, well, who took that up? Like who spent the time to actually try to do that? And a lot of it was just uh, providers who were already, who had practiced in New Jersey at some point in time, but now they were at home in their respective border states and they need to be able to have their license apply in those other states and patients maybe were uh, crossing borders. So a lot of this was about border activities. It wasn't like new people coming in from another state, jumping into New Jersey from California. It wasn't necessarily people like that who were coming. And unfortunately, a lot of people who applied for the uh, ability to uh, practice uh, in New Jersey uh, included folks like in, uh, mental health providers. And they applied for this opportunity to use their license within the state of New Jersey, kind of taking advantage of these changes in policy but they never actually saw any patients. They didn't use it. So just because people, because in some ways they didn't have any established relationships with patients. So how did they manage to actually find them? So it was an interesting concept, but how it all played out was a lot more nuanced than that. But in general, these are conversations that have been going on for decades. I, and you're probably most, most familiar with it about MPs versus um, PC, uh, primary care physicians and the tensions that we sometimes hear about um, you know, should a nurse practitioner substitute for the role of physicians? And there's a lot of good literature at this point in time that would suggest that where the two groups overlap, they provide equivalent care quality-wise in terms of increasing access by adding uh, increasing scope of practice for nurse practitioners. It certainly seems to improve access, especially in rural communities. Um, 
However, I would argue that we shouldn't be looking at where the two necessarily overlap. We should talk about all the needs that we have, how much of that need are we fulfilling, and then what are the other things that maybe physicians should be doing that they're not currently doing that is outside the scope of practice and nurse practitioners and focus on how to elevate some of those kinds of skills. And MPs versus physicians, this is not, you're not the only ones who have these conversations. This happens across the healthcare industry. This happens between physical therapists and physical therapy assistants. This happens between RNs and medical assistants. This happens over and over again. Dental, uh, dental hygienists versus dentists. People are having this conversation all the time. It's, it's a delicate conversation. I was saying there's so much need to go around. We should be focused on thinking about how do we fulfill the need that we have the best and, and make sure that people, when they go through their education, that we leverage as much of their education and training as possible. <clears throat> we have a wonderful program uh, within the Center for Health Workforce Studies called the Sentinel Network. This is really the brainchild of Sue Skillman, the Senior Deputy Director of CHOOSE. Um, and uh, we have a wonderful team, including Ben Stubbs, research scientist in our, uh, in our uh, center, as well as Grace Dunther and uh, Amy Clark, or, uh, who many of you know through our kind of web work that we do, where they've been actively collecting data now for several years from employers around the state via a survey mechanism that goes out now it's about two times a year. Uh, and these surveys are designed to identify signals from employers about the challenges that they're facing in hiring people, uh, both in terms of recruiting and retaining workers. And this is a survey that's done across multiple healthcare employers. So you have, uh, you can break this out by different settings like hospitals, FQHCs, nursing homes, but there's all sorts of ways that you can dive into this uh, publicly available dashboard. So you can actually go to this website and look at some of the responses that are here. This is not meant to be your very precise uh, data collection where you have a certain representation of workers. This is really trying to do a multi-year ongoing rapid response system so we can see what are the trends in the types of workers people are struggling to employ and how long are the vacancies happening here. It's a way for employers to go back and say, are we alone in this? Are other people also struggling with these problems? Now, what I'm showing here is that um, a lot of the challenges that uh, and potential solutions I mentioned on the prior slide were things that we're hearing from employers themselves as things that they're doing. So it's to say, I can sit here and tell you all the things that we should be and could be doing about addressing health workforce shortages and health workforce supply challenges. These are what workers are saying, these are what employers are saying that they're actually doing. They're recognizing and paying attention to the needs. And I realize that some of the coloring is kind of lost here, but they are saying things like, they're trying to create more flexible schedules. They're trying to increase wages. They are trying to think about the affordability of health insurance. They're trying to address these issues that we know will help maybe move the needle. Now, how successful it is, that's something that is, is kind of an ongoing challenge. And some of that has to do with the fact that healthcare, again, is a major employer, but they're not the only employer in the economy. We are competing for workers all the time. And think about the ads you see on TV. I, this is how I really thought about it when I um, was like watching TV one day and I think it was a McDonald's commercial and they have students who are showing their acceptance letter to a college because McDonald's is paying for their tuition. Now there's other concerns about whether or not those things actually come to fruition and all that kind of stuff, but they advertise it. They advertise the fact that they support additional education so they can further their, their careers. I've heard Zillow also talk about how they do that too, that they train workers up into other industries that may not even be their own because they see that as a betterment for society and they bother doing that. Uh, a lot of uh, employers, uh, especially in the retail setting and food services setting, they're competing for workers who are in our aid and assistant jobs in particular. Those are, again, these folks have about a high school level degree. They haven't spent years necessarily on their education. So that what we as economists call barriers to entry are very low for people in those jobs to come into these jobs, but they're just as low to leave these jobs and move to somewhere else where they can get their needs fulfilled in terms of pay, paid sick leave, uh, things like tuition reimbursement and whatnot. Oh, I'm sorry, this is coming out to be really small text for those here in the room. <laughs> so again, uh, recently this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, again, a uh, few uh, my colleagues and I, but really informed by a larger request of health workforce experts uh, out, who came together in Bozeman, Montana, uh, discussed about how 
you know, these workforce shortages, and we really hesitate to use the word shortage because shortage is kind of a, uh, it feels like a very singular yes or no term. Do we have a shortage or not? It's a lot more complex than that. It's more of a, a nuanced conversation. We have a lot of dentists, for example, in urban areas, but not enough in rural areas. So do we have a shortage of dentists? Well, it depends on what geographic location you're talking about. Do we have a shortage of, shortage of A's and assistants? Well, again, it depends on what geographic location, depends on what is the community you're talking about. Did you want diversity in the workforce? Well, maybe it's not the right mix of folks who are there. So again, shortage is a word we try to stay a little bit away from, but nonetheless, we have been here before where we are feeling this struggle of finding workers. And it has happened, especially for the nursing workforce. This has happened, it has, has swung back and forth, especially, uh, yeah, it was probably about like, 10, 15 years ago now, uh, where we felt that people were predicting a 1 million uh, nursing shortage uh, was going to come to fruition. It did not come to fruition because of the Great Recession. Uh, when the Great Recession hit, uh, a lot of women who were nurses stayed in the workforce because many of their husbands or spouses lost jobs. And so they could continue to work. And so some of that 1 million um, didn't come to fruition, as well as the fact that projections have a lot of challenges. They're not always designed to come to fruition. They're kind of designed to move policymakers to do something, to scare them, to say, oh, a million people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. We should do something. So they do something. And so this framework is trying to identify some of the things that we know people have tried to do in the past uh, and things that we should be focused on as we think about workforce challenges in the future. And while this paper was specifically talking about the nursing workforce, it was really meant to be a broadly applied uh, framework to think about when we talk about workforce challenges, you have to think about the inflows, the outflows, but really the bulk of people are currently working. So we should really put the focus on where people work now and how to retain the workers. We cannot train enough people fast enough to get ourselves out of this problem. So in terms of feeling like there aren't enough workers, we have to focus on the current workers, make them figure out what would keep you here versus leaving us for some other industry. And we have to spend that kind of time. And among the things that we highlighted, things that we need to do is just even identify what are people doing? We don't even know. And that's a big part of what some of our research is, is trying to track what are some things that are working? Because we know, we hear anecdotes. Again, some little network is a great way to kind of identify some trends over time, the things that may be working. But we need some better ways to pull that together. So just some final thoughts. So the workforce uh, in our healthcare industry has really We've gone through all sorts of turmoil during the <clears throat> pandemic. It's really fluctuated, but it's on the road to, rec to recovery. So that's encouraging. Um, skilled nursing facilities are still struggling, and that is what is one of the drivers for what we're still feeling across the healthcare industry. We are all interlinked. That's 17 million people. We we, we often think in silos, we often work in silos, but really we're all connected. I just make a note that when we're doing some work here to understand the role of the broader macroeconomic factors that drive trends. So I, I read the news and so the word recession shows up and I really grab onto those headlines because there is a general thing that in healthcare, uh, healthcare has done very well in terms of employment during recessions. Because a lot of jobs are lost in the retail and food services industry because people don't want to pay for those services. So those jobs are gone. And where are their jobs? Healthcare. Healthcare seems to always have jobs. And they do particularly well during recessions, probably not for the best of reasons, but among the theories are that it's a tough time for people. They need healthcare. They're feeling particularly stressed. They need to go see their provider. Maybe they now have time because they're now unemployed. So healthcare tends to do pretty well during recessions. So if there's a recession, the one silver lining is that maybe healthcare will do better. But we don't want to wait for a recession to solve our problem. There are solutions to these problems. Um, and, and in particular, we really need to think about those retention strategies to keep workers. And um, if, if we deploy them right, then we should be able to mitigate some of this. We don't have a national coordinating body to solve these problems. A lot of employers are left to their own devices to sort this out, to look at their competitors, see what they're doing. We don't really necessarily want to share those ideas. But that's where researchers like us and our colleagues across the country try to bring together like what's working and what's not. Um, but it's a tough, it's a tough go. We don't have great data on a lot of things. So we're trying to leverage whatever data we have. Uh, I think we look towards what's happening, uh, what what broader labor 
studies are doing and finding and apply some of those learnings to the healthcare industry because healthcare is unique to some degree, but it's not. It's an employer, just like any other employer. They need to meet the needs of their workers, just like any other employer. So with that, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Online too, so I don't know how we're doing on that. So. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned childcare and, and the challenge of that for workers. My question is about the childcare industry and that as a competing industry, yeah, for example, yeah. for nursing homes, because they're yeah. both probably similarly low wage workers. And, um, yes. and I, I will just say that in driving here, NPR was talking about childcare and actually how at the federal level, the one place where something had been done was the Department of Defense mm -hmm. started doing child care for active duty service yeah. people. And that you needed federal support for that. And it seems like the nursing home industry is a similar industry. And the, and the women that we're talking about in these workforce issues are often also carrying a burden yeah. of family responsibilities, not not that men should not be carrying those yeah. very same burdens, but yeah. you you witness this over and over again. And I just wondered from an economist perspective, yeah. what are your insights? No, thank you for bringing that up. And again, child care is a very important piece to the puzzle. And I think a lot of folks recognize the importance of that, especially to keep women in the workforce. And to some degree, there was some good news that by in the recent job numbers, women with children have been coming back in pretty good numbers uh, and they have recovered past beyond kind of where they would have expected to be otherwise. So that that's very positive. But some of that is related to some federal subsidies that have been put into place for child care that are going to come to an end. Um, and uh, to your question about kind of the competition piece of it, that is something that uh, Jeanette Mill, uh, Latron and Trotter, who's in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities here, uh, and a postdoc, Kyla Woodward, out of school of nursing, the four of us are looking at some of those trends. And there does seem to be this kind of counter cyclical experience between aides and assistants and childcare workers. And it does seem to have some correlation with the supply of workers in some of those more middle to high skilled jobs as defined by education. So we, we're just starting to scratch the surface there, but certainly does seem to be a relationship. Thank you, Josh. There's a question online. Um, has anyone researched the effect of workplace violence on some of these factors? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so workplace violence certainly is a big topic that I just skirted, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, that kind of falls in that area of uh, workers who are um, willing to work. And a lot of workers are saying, no, patients aren't treating me well. I'm not treated well by other workers. This is a tough go. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of recognition of the need to address workplace violence. Um, I'm not quickly coming to uh, uh, mind some names to kind of put out there, but I do know that folks are looking at this issue. I think some of my colleagues at George Washington University are doing some technical assistance around some of this. But um, I do know that, uh, I think it was first said, uh, got quite a bit of money to help think through some technical assistance to support folks to do, uh, to address workplace violence. So the last two turnovers that I've had have been directly related to oh, yeah, really? the way that they're treated by patients. Oh gosh. So it just, for those who couldn't hear, it just, um, it does sound like it's having real life effects, workplace violence in terms of turnover. That's and I think too. especially like at least in the outpatient environment, for individuals that are kind of in those flexible roles, right? Like if you work at the front desk here, you make a great salary, you have great benefits, but there are other options. Yeah. One individual left customer service altogether because he just didn't want to deal with it anymore. And the other is going to stay in customer service, but going somewhere where maybe the conversations are not as contentious or, yeah. Yeah, there's certainly a feeling of things just being amped up since COVID's hit, right? And, and we had a lot of people are feeling a lot of pent up anger, and it's kind of coming out. As a society, we seem to have lost our manners to some degree. I'm not, I'm not so sure what all is happening. A lot of people are pondering this too. We have seen a lot of exits in the workforce generally, where people are just saying, I, I just don't want this life of work as we have it constructed in the United States. 
this is happening in Europe too. It's not just us, but in the US, we are certainly having this kind of realization, especially I think among younger generations who are saying, this is not life. This is not how I want my life to be. And um, I think we really need to pause and say, yeah, what is this life of work that we just accept and continue? Is right. this acceptable long-term? Well, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, any other questions? There's lots of food. Lots of food. One person or five. There's a survey online, and next month we will have Dr. Danielson come and speak about advancing equity. So come next month as well. Great. Thank you for having me. Can I let the staff know? Sure. I think, yeah. Yeah. So should I leave it up? Should I leave it out there?